There are literally dozens of us. Hey everyone, welcome back to Linux Weekly, daily Wednesdays where we sit back, relax, take that midweek break, talk about some of the fun things going on in the world of Linux and open source, and Linux is, uh, oh, it's going to be at 4% this week, stick around Woo-hoo. for that, I'm Vince Stone, that was Jill Bryant, everybody, we were just uh, having a little bit of fun in the pre-show, talking about things, watching an Adam Sandler movie in space, I know, terrifying, if you cool. want to catch that, uh, if you're a patron, go back and uh, listen to it, we got the pre-pre, you know, it's like our own little mini pre-pre super shows that we do on Saturday, yeah. but we do on Wednesday. We do the live and uncut series and we make that available just for you. But don't worry, we have a uncut channel on YouTube a week later that comes out. You get the video version. But if you do want that podcast version, go check it out on Patreon. Jill, talking <laughs> a little bit earlier, you're getting a little excited, a little wound up. You got a bunch going on in the next two weeks. Oh, I, I do. I do. Uh... Uh, scale is actually happening uh, March 14th through 17th, 2024. I've been talking about it for at least the last month here on LWW. And for our Linux Chicks LA booth, uh, we're gonna, we, you can come and spin the Linux Chicks LA Wheel of Swag to win a Penguin Surprise. And we have some cool, awesome raffles planned for some great electronics. But it's a surprise. And so our booth is number 418. And you can also visit the Lutris booth, which is going to be right, right, right. Uh, it's going to be near us, not right next door, but near us at booth number 422. And um, you can use the promo code CHIX on the first page of registration to get 50% off your scale pass <laughs> to come see us. So that would be awesome. And you can also come see me at the Destination Linux booth. Um, Otherwise known as the Tux Digital Booth, which are, was, is our network. But I will be at both, and they're both next to each other, and Strider's Booth is next to us, too. <laughs> so it's just, I've been planning, doing so much planning. I'm, I'm setting up interviews with some very well-known people in the Linux community. <laughs> so that's going to be cool. Yeah, there's just, there have been so much to do. I got a pack for our booths, which I've already been doing. And I'm just very, very excited. And and I hope if you're, especially if you're based here in Los Angeles or California, you can come to scale. It's amazing. It's it's the U.S.'s largest Linux uh, community run convention. And also, uh, then we had fun uh, last Friday uh, playing Track Track Mania with our our. Trackmania final streams that we do on on Friday, and I got through the Timu gaming keyboard track twice, but of course I had to do a lot of practice to do that. So I I had finished it, I got through it two times before, and then got through it two times during our finals. <laughs> so I was so happy about that. Sounds fun. Sounds like a good time. Glad uh, everybody's going to be able to get together on scale. And that's going to be March 14th through 17th over at the Pasadena Convention Center. Is there still time to go ahead and grab tickets? Can you get, a, yes. can I, just, can yes. I get them at the door, Jill Bryant? You can I, as of right now. That's all I needed know right now. So if I show up <laughs> day there, are they going to tell me to go away even if they don't have tickets? Or are they just going to be at maximum capacity? Do I got to like uh, bribe somebody, give them some no, money? Be I like, hey, go. why don't you guys come out? I like wave a $100 bill outside the door. And I'm like, hey, you want to step outside so I can get in? No, I would uh, actually uh, pre-register online before you you come to the event. That way, you know you got a ticket and a spot. <laughs> Sounds fun, ladies and gentlemen. I've been playing around with a bunch of stuff this week. I didn't get one, but two different things out. Something I've been meaning to do for a long time. As I did a write-up, because you might remember, I did. Uh, hey, what the delete exploit of his net jack to explain how the audio over IP system works in the studio. And I made that video and I'm like, man, I'm always going to go back and do a write-up. It's been like six months. Oh. <laughs> so now over <laughs> at Interfacing Linux, we got a full write-up that nice. explains how everything works. And in keeping in tradition, we talked about Adore last week. Oh, I thought it was time to make a new compiling Adore on Debian, because the last one I made was compiling Adore 6 on Debian 10. <laughs> Oh, wow. Yeah. Now we have Adore 8 <laughs> with all the dependencies that have been updated and tested by yours truly. So you know it's going to work. So, you know, if you're on Fedora, you're on Next, hey, maybe you're still running Arch, 
you can look at that and you can translate everything you need. Punch in the commands. This one's a little weird because it still uses the WAF build system, mm -hmm. you know, which is like scones, but not quite scones. And that might be moon speaker. Like we're just making config. We're CMake. Oh, it was way before that. But it does work mm -hmm. and gets the job done. Now, who remembers this guy? The YouTuber special. Oh, yeah. The focus Remember, right. <laughs> the, the red focus, focus right. The, the <laughs> Gen 3, the darling of YouTubers. And like, yeah, yeah. you know, I, I don't blame anybody because, you know, I did a little review on it a while back. And I'm like, yeah, I, I think it was a bit much, a bit pricey, but it's still a solid piece of kit. Well, turns out if you don't keep track of these guys, they breed. Now I have another one. Oh, there you go. <laughs> oh, you might be wondering, what's the difference? <laughs> huh. Hmm. This is the new one. This is generation four one. Oh. Which is going to have support landing in kernel 6.8. Cool. And it's got a bunch of tools to play around with. And we're going to be plugging this in and finding out what it takes to get the latest and greatest in YouTuber audio interface technology up and running on Linux to make that a smooth transition for anybody because uh, it's got a little more brains in these, you know, I don't think I thought it'd be fun. Stay tuned for that. It's going to take a little while to get that tested out, but let's go ahead and jump into the big news of the yeah. past week, which is Linux market share going over 4%. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So this is just so exciting for, for those of us in the Linux community. So StatCounter reports that for the first time, the Linux desktop market share is above 4%. Woohoo! Linux now has 4.03% of the desktop market, and that is actually a huge jump from the 1.53% that existed at the end of 2020. You remember, Ven, one time it even hit, it, it, it hit like 2% in one month, and we were so thrilled. Yeah, well, I, <laughs> like, I, I, don't, I don't, numbers aren't real. I can't trust them. Yeah. <laughs> so our, there are, of course, many awesome reasons why this is happening. You know, Windows 11, you know, only works on newer systems now. The installers on Linux distros are just so much easier and faster. Uh, they've actually always been faster than Windows anyways. <laughs> but the OS is also plug and play. And it works on older systems and people don't need to spend the cash to upgrade and they can keep that computer out of the landfill. <laughs> so there's lots of awesome re reasons, let alone the increased adoption to Linux of apps. A lot of companies are porting their apps to Linux and the sheer popularity of the Steam Deck, which is making people more curious about Linux. So it's all been really good. But what is interesting about Stack Counter? is that Chrome OS is not counted in the Linux desktop stats, but as a separate operating system, which I actually do understand why, but it does use the Linux kernel at the end of the day and is closer to Linux than Android is. So honestly, if it had been counted, Chrome OS had been counted, it would be over 6% market share. <laughs> so Ben, what are your thoughts on this? <laughs> Well, I mean, on that same vein, you know, let's, let's count all the Windows uh, point of sale registers in the world, too, if we're going to count Chromebooks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely. <laughs> That'd be kind of crazy. So let's think about this, man. Uh, we all know whether or not you want to admit it. Desktops, we're dying breed. Desktop users. Like, uh, there's some people who are going to be pushed back, like, no, oh, and I'm like, I can back that up with maths. And yeah, more charts. we can. I mean, I will yeah. win here. Oh, uh, at least between... Where, where is it dying? Well, desktop use is dying between creation, creators and consumers. Like if you are doing content creation, if you're, you're making stuff, more likely you have a desktop. If you're not, you know, if you're sitting back, you're like, hey, I like watching the stuff and um, maybe playing the occasional game. You probably, you might have a laptop. More than likely you got a mobile device, probably a gaming console. Mm -hmm. The average person, especially ones on the younger side, they're going to be using their phones. They're going to be using their tablets. And if you don't believe me, look around. Like, oh, yeah. That's all you got to do, man. Like, again, like, <laughs> I don't feel like arguing on the internet with people. Now, people looking for that desktop experience. This is where it gets interesting. This is what we're starting to see. This is how it's shaken out is we're having, you know, if you're like, I need a desktop because I need to make some stuff or I got some special needs. You're having to actively seek that out now 
because not everybody just has a desktop PC. You're like, well, I need to set up a desktop PC. I got a reason for it. And that means, unlike previously for the past 30 years where everything was just a Windows desktop and you just went to the Windows desktop store and you bought a PC at Best Buy, that's kind of a specialty item. That means Linux is in the running because you're starting from point zero. You're like, well, I need to build a desktop PC. Yeah, or maybe I need to buy one. And there's a Linux option sitting out there. Windows is no longer the default. It's just choice A or choice B, however you want to look at it, unless you're like some weirdo that wants to run Haiku. <laughs> yeah. Maybe that could be a thing. There's going to be literally dozens of us, but then I firmly believe that's one of the reasons we've seen that spike. And somebody's going to be like, what about the Steam Deck? I kind of went and looked at that. Like, if you want to, like, maybe the top 4% of those numbers we've seen about, uh, according to Steam DB, I think um, year over year it was because uh, we're basically looking at the iGPU that's in the Steam Deck, APU uh, as that yeah. metric, probably about a 30% bump on Steam side. So if that's being counted. As for Chromebooks, I could go back and forth. I understand both arguments from that. It's like, it's technically Linux. I'm like, well, let's just count Android too. And they're like, well, that's not Linux. I'm like, about as much as a Chromebook is, man. Let's be honest. Yeah, oh. <laughs> it does have those pr pr proprietary blobs. <laughs> that Google right. Puts uh, on there, yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, the people who have desktop PCs, we're getting a smaller group, but that in its own way is good for Linux because the people who want to build these PCs are making informed choices. They're not just inheriting their parents' desktop PCs and getting stuck yes. on Windows. They're like, oh, I, okay, I need to research this. What do I want to do? Oh, maybe I'll try this Linux thing or I'll try this Windows thing which is cool. And we're going to see uh, higher yeah. and higher adoption. Good Absolutely. News. There are literally dozens of us. <laughs> there, there are. And fortunately, you know, with the, uh, the popularity of the Raspberry Pi, a lot of young people are exposed, you know, to a different operating system other than Windows. And some of them, some of these kids have never even used a desktop PC with a mouse because they're using or, or they're using uh, laptops or, uh, you know, mobile <laughs> or tablets <laughs> well, I, like well, the laptop i definitely consider um again it's still like trying to explain to a 12 13 year old who you would consider to be very computer literate i've talked to one in real life no concept of how folder structures work yeah yeah that's true yeah you're like wow okay mm -hmm. that's the danger you you can end up like hey things are great now you don't need to understand how that works i'm like well that, that can come back yeah, and yeah. bite us. Uh, yeah, if you got a kid, yeah. teach him, teach mm -hmm. him about folder structures. Get him running Linux. Get him, get him running a desktop operating system. Let, let's not let the intelligence curve slide down to where we don't have people that know how to do anything. Yeah, exactly. That would be for the best. <laughs> All this is going to be in our show notes. Go check it out later. But I want to talk to you about Thunderbird. Why are we talking about Thunderbird? Well, they do email, and you might remember a while back uh, they kind of showed up and yoinked themselves. A K9 mail. Mm, K9 mail is something I've been using on Android for a long time. And like a lot of people, I'm like, don't mess this up. Please don't mess up K9 mail. So far, they haven't. Actually, this is really good news. Yes. New version 6.8 is out. Mm -hmm. And if you're watching the video version, what's on the screen right there had me very excited. New account set up. And I said, joy of all joys for that because entering email accounts on mobile always yeah. a bad experience Pain. it's not good no yeah. one says yay i mean you have to be really bored to be like i can't wait to set up a new phone and do all of this because on mobile you typically are going to have i am um, you know even gmail if you're using that on android it's a little wizard that's going to try to auto connect to your big accounts it's not too bad but if you're like me and you run your own email server that means you're manually punching in all the incoming outgoing imap servers setting your encryption smtp for sending mail mm -hmm. it is <laughs> crazy tedious work if you got a bunch of email accounts uh, like i do yeah, uh, i love it I'm like, that's an afternoon i will put it off so <laughs> this new system you feed it a username or an email address it's at least going to take a crack at it which is really good uh it's going to try to populate all your settings um and like even if it doesn't get it 100 percent, if it can get me like 60 percent of the way there at least to uh, you know, identify that, hey, it's an IMAP server, and what's your incoming, what's your outgoing, do you require, what type of encryption are you using, and do you need a password? And I'm like, if it can populate that, where I just got to punch in, you know, just a bunch of stuff, you know, a couple of things at the end, I'll be very happy with it. And there's a nice uh, collection of bug fixes along with uh, everything else in 6.8. 
good to see if you're not using uh, 8 mil. I strongly suggest it. Mm-hmm. I liked it. I decided to just try it because I've, I've been using Gmail forever. Why? Because it came on the Android tablet yeah. and I didn't have to mess with it. Yeah. I went through the trouble, you know, downloading this and setting it up. I'm like, let's give this a good chance. Still a big fan of it. Audacity 3.5 is out. Uh, yeah. It's a little so, bit of a beta. Yeah, it is. It is. So the Audacity open source audio editor has a new beta release, Audacity 3.5.0 beta, and it has several really cool new features. The big one to me is that you can now set up cloud saves in Audacity to save your Audacity projects to audio.com. All you have to do is make an account at audio.com and you can automatically up upload your audacity files to it free of charge in fact i did that as i was reading this article (laughs) and actually in the article on github audacity states this allows you to work from any device share and collaborate with others and restore previous versions if something went wrong yeah absolutely it's just so nice to have another uh, uh, backup system that happens immediately (laughs) which is really cool. And Audacity also has a new tempo detection feature, which adjusts imported loops to be in tempo, which is really, really nice, especially for those musicians out there. And there is a new non-destructive pitch shifting feature for clips. All you have to do is, is hold Alt and the up and down arrow keys to adjust your pitch shifting and it works non-destructively so it won't it won't interfere with the original file which is really cool oh that's pretty cool um yeah yeah, i'm just taking a look around on you know audio.com because let's be honest you know ever since muse bought audacity Mm -hmm. rightfully so you should scrutinize everything that they do (laughs) yeah (laughs) you need to um and you know i'm looking over everything here at audio.com and you know it is completely free and you do retain all of your copyrights to everything what i can't see is are they or are they not training um on the data for your oh. uh, waveform so okay if yeah. you find anything let me know in the comments let me know in the comments because i always like to err on the side of caution but i don't see any like downside here you know i was expecting like hey this is commercial and all that this looks like they're trying to do a good mm-hmm. no Hopefully that's exactly what they're trying to do. Also back up your projects in multiple places and don't yes. only rely on cloud. Make three backups of everything. That's that's our motto. <laughs> Have it remote, uh, 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 remote, cloud, and local. And you got the basis covered. Now, mm-hmm. who here has ever tried to cool their PC? Oh, oh, we've all been there. <laughs> I just said most of you are like, man, that's overrated. I don't even put a heat sink on it. I just let it run uh, natural. Yeah. <laughs> like, why is it only at 100 megahertz? Probably not. Well, how about we take a little trip and exploit some thermal mass Woo-hoo. for fun and profit? Okay. Now, because if you ever really wanted to dial in the fans and bumps on your PC, this might be a way to do it because you know what noise is a battle i'm fighting noise right now i am in a eternal struggle with a noise floor in the studio Mm -hmm. because i am in the middle of not one nay five pcs yeah (laughs) and instead of playing around with fan curves like i do this dude he took another approach he brought python and grafana into the mix they showed up to the party because he really wanted to get this dialed in so what he's doing here he's controlling the not just the fans but the pump speed that's based on the cpu temperature fan speed is typically what you do this is also taking in to account the temperature of the liquid so whatever you know usually like propylene glycol you got running through the radiator and charting all that out he created a script it does a complete load test to calibrate the system and he decided to parse all the in- info with Grafana, and it runs all the bits on a systemd service called Fan Goblin 3. But reading through the, you know, of course, taking advantage of Python LM sensors, but what I found 
something very interested in. This is great. There'll be a link in the show notes. And he said he was able to get it because he was talking about the Noctua fans, which um, are guaranteed to run up uh, down to about 20%. But he's like, no, you can make him go lower. This is a great deep dive to read through. And he does warn you, like, be careful with all this because you'll need to adapt it to your system if you want to try to get a truly silent system. You're going to get everything calibrated. Fun read. I really enjoyed going through it. I suggest you do too if you want to make a Stufu box that has some fans and you can still deal with mm -hmm. some load. But this liquid CTL was a little bit of a thing. I'm like, I don't know if I've talked about that maybe in the past. Maybe I was aware of it. But if you have a Corsair or NZXT AIO, this is the tool you've been looking for because by default, your pump speed's 100%. Which normally you can't hear, but you can kind of hear it is there. And as they get older, that pump's going to get louder. This is a handy tool to allow you to control it and to set it on a curve, which is arguably a good idea, arguably a bad idea. I can make a case for why that would be bad for a pump, but also good for a pump, depending on the particular use cases. Not only that, this thing also um, controls a bunch of different lighting tools, um, LED controllers, like from Aqua Computer, a bunch of Corsair NZXT stuff, and uh, select EVGA 1070s. Now how much would you pay? Nothing, because it's open source. I want you to go check it out. Happy to see that, because uh, one of the things I have to do is I have summertime and wintertime <laughs> curves for not one machine, five. Yes, you, know, it, you do. <laughs> you're sitting there going, yeah, I, I, I spend an afternoon playing with it, load testing, get everything set. Yeah, do, do that four more times. Also have profiles for two different seasons. And uh, yeah, it's always that race to like get things like super, super quiet or is at least uh, as quiet as possible. And I think that this is also important for people because I people want to build those little thermal death boxes, those shoe yeah. boxes, those micro PCs, because they think they look cute. And I'm like, that's a great way to kill your hardware early. So kill your hardware less <laughs> early and make it slightly more quiet by uh, yeah. <laughs> looking up solutions. And yeah, is, anytime I see somebody bringing a Grafana into the mix, I'm like, what are you up to? Because they're usually yeah. up to something kind of fun. And uh, this was no um, exception. Really glad to see uh jill do you like a big i used to like big loud fans and still i have yeah. like set up this room i had a yeah one of the vantech <laughs> tornado fans i still have it oh yeah yeah and you remember the uh, uh uh pci fans how how loud and noisy those were and i used to have to have the a lot, a lot of those to cool my scuzzy drives back in the day the, um, <laughs> talk the, about noisy i spend a decade crawling around data centers but uh, yeah. like the if you can find an example i might just do a little video of plugging that thing and i forget how many rpm the vantech tornado fan was at the time you could hear it from rooms away an 80 millimeter fan to give you an idea of the speed yeah. the one time i was building a pc and i had the cooler on and i didn't have it mounted to the top of the cooler i had the fan because it was a three pin molex right mm -hmm. and i, I just mm -hmm. had the fan sitting on my lap, just right on top of me and, you know, on the floor doing the little thing cross leg. And I, I'm like, okay, let me see if the thing boots. And I hit that and I forgot about the fan being plugged in. That fan had enough torque, has enough torque to jump and unplug itself. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like it shot up. And I was like, ah, like that thing, it, it, it wouldn't, it would take a finger off. Um, Maybe well, you can still yeah. find them. Do a, do a search online. See if I'm sure somebody's got a YouTube video of one being like insanely loud. Anyway, I no longer like loud stuff. Yes. <laughs> yes we used I to have to live with it. I want it as quiet as possible. <laughs> and, yes, uh, you do. <laughs> how do you do that? I do it with like big uh, Swiss cheese Corsair cases, strangely enough. You know, there's ones that are just filled with holes and uh, big 140 millimeter fans that are barely turning and just getting stuff hot. But you know what? We don't have to worry mm -hmm. about it so much anymore because now CPUs have the ability to thermally throttle. Yeah. Instead of melting. Instead of melting <laughs> and turn shutting down. Do you remember the flip chip <laughs> AMDs? I popped a couple of those cores back in the day. Yeah. Um, ladies and gentlemen, that's going to wrap us up <laughs> for this afternoon. 
this show. As Jill said, going to be taking the next two weeks off. I might get up to something. I'm not going to make any promises. I don't have anything planned. So that could be a good thing <laughs> or a bad thing because I got a bunch of stuff to catch up on. But keep an eye out on the schedule over at twitch.tv forward slash Linux <laughs> Gamecast. All right. We will see ya. Woohoo! <laughs> next time. <laughs> Thank you to our executive producers like Artharon in chat and our Chicago Kicks peoples like Super Dust Out and our Sea Monsters, Trug Gills, Vera Tenuta, Justin and our Death Notes, Rue, Turnover, Ogiwan, and Fox Dog and our Chairlings, Door to Door Geek, Colin, and too many for me to name. <laughs> All right, beautiful people. Have a great rest of your week. I'm going to be back. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Friday, we'll be doing Track Mania. Come hang out with us. Do it. I dare you. Oh, you get, it, get your information in there if you're a patron or a Twitch sub. Link it up to our Discord. Everything's pinned in there, and we'll see you there at 730. And, of course, Linux Gamecast Weekly, 830, <laughs> right yes. here on Twitch. <laughs> see ya. Bye, everyone. Love you all. <laughs>